All right, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa Raby. I'm the Systems and Web Librarian here at the college. And I will also be the moderator for this evening. And along with myself, the library, and uh, the Muslim Journeys Bookshelf, we are pleased to present Sally Namad, um, an award-winning science fiction and fantasy author, to give his talk tonight. Um, and before I begin fangirling Mr. Ahmad, I need to point a few things that, um, if you're unfamiliar with the campus, um, the ladies' restroom is on this side, the men's restroom is on that side. If you parked in the Boswick parking lot, which is across the street from us, um, there's the um, exit is actually unmanned, so it does take cash, credit, and debit cards. Um, if you have any questions about any of those things, let me know after the event and I'll help you out. Uh, and now on to the fangirling. Um, I first came across Aladdin's work a few years ago through a mutual friend of ours um, who um, had introduced me to his debut book, uh, Throne of the Crescent Moon, and I've been a fangirl ever since. And it's no surprise. He has won the Locus Award for the Best First Novel for Throne of the Crescent Moon. He has also been nominated and a finalist for the Hugo, the Nebula, the Crawford, the Jemmel, and the British Fantasy Awards. And this also does not include the awards and accolades he has won for his short stories, prose, and poetry. Um, his work transcends his contemporaries in not only his genre, but all genres. And his characters are people that you get heavily invested in from the very beginning, and his worlds are places where you want to live in. He is passionate of voice, he's an enchanting voice, and he has a very powerful voice. His work is provocative, thought-provoking, and underscored with humor that teaches us to look at each other and within ourselves and not to take ourselves too seriously when, while telling a great story at the same time. Well, I'm sad to report Mr. Ahmad did not show up wearing Speedos and <laughs> a Spider-Man mask as he had claimed he was going to do on Twitter. I think we'll take him just the way he is. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to present to you Saladin Ahmad. Um, hello. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I did threaten to wear a Speedo and a Spider-Man mask, and I'm sure you're all really happy I didn't. So, um, uh, I'm here to talk uh, about um, uh, writing Muslim American fantasy, I think is the name of the talk. And uh, um, it'll be fairly informal here. Um, I'm more used to letting my writing speak for itself, and so uh, the bulk of what I'm going to be doing up here is <coughs> reading a couple short stories for you guys, but uh, I did want to give uh, some kind of introductory remarks on the, uh, on the topic. Um, so if we're talking about writing Muslim American fantasy, you know, what does it mean to write Muslim American fantasy? Uh, what does, uh, or Muslim American fiction in general, um, uh, how does one do it? Um, uh, I guess the answer is just that uh, uh, there's no one answer. Um, for me, uh, I, I guess it's a little weird, and this is a, something that I think that uh, pretty much anyone who's a, a writer or an artist um, who uh, is writing as uh, a member of a marginalized group, uh, whether uh, you're a woman painter, or whether you're uh, a gay actor, or whatever uh, you might be, uh, you have this label on your life and it interacts with your work in a strange way. That is, uh, on the one hand, um, you know, it's the kiss of death and the worst thing in the world if somebody says, well, uh, um, you know, he's a great black writer. Well, you know, so why am I not just a, a great writer, right? Or he's a great Muslim painter. Well, why am I not just a painter? And yet, um, it's, uh, for most of us, I think, who are kind of from uh, uh, these backgrounds that are not necessarily in the mainstream, uh, it is a big part of, of, of who you are, and it does affect what you write. And I, um, I absolutely, uh, it's central to me and to what I write that I come from this place. So um, to start out by telling you just a little bit about my background, um, I'm a fiction writer. Uh, you know, Lisa went through all the you know, award nomination stuff, so I won't bore you guys with that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a fiction writer. I'm a fantasy fiction writer. Um, I wrote poetry for a good number of years and uh, um, uh, have my kind of training as a poet in some ways, um, but uh, really I've become most known as a, as a writer of, of fiction. Um, my first novel, Throne of the Crescent Moon, uh, came out last year, uh, 2012, 
um, and, and to get, you know, uh, some nice mentions and, and notice. Um, and I've also had a number of short stories in magazines here and there. Um, mostly fantasy, a little bit of kind of science fiction and actually superhero stuff here and there. Um, so uh, uh, I, but as my bread and butter, I'm a fantasy writer at the core of what I do. And uh, the vast majority of things I write do have kind of a, a cultural influence and or a cast uh, uh, that is of a either Islamic or Arab or a kind of quasi-Islamic or Arab uh, um, influence in terms of the culture. Um, and the fact that I write that kind of stuff is kind of the almost natural uh, um, mix of, of, of things that made me. I uh, grew up about two and a half hours uh, east of here, um, just outside of Detroit in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, Dearborn is famous for, for two things, um, for being Henry Ford's hometown, you know, the birthplace. Uh, you know, people say, the car was born in Detroit, uh, but in a, in a stricter sense, it was born in in Dearborn, Michigan, and and you know that's the birth of the assembly line. Um, uh, and in more recent decades, it's become known as uh, kind of the unofficial capital of Arab America. Um, uh, there have been Arab immigrants in uh, Dearborn for for decades and decades and decades, um, uh, but especially in the past 20, 30, 40 years, um, there's been a, a real concentration there, so much so that uh, um, if you talk to Arabs from other parts of the world, other parts of America, um, it's astonishing how many people, for being this you know, relatively small city of 100,000 people, uh, how many people have heard of Dearborn and kind of know its reputation, the restaurants there and the, um, the kind of community that's there. Um, I uh, grew up my father was born here. Uh, my mother uh, is uh, Irish American. My father is uh, Arab American, but born here. Um, so I grew up in a very kind of weird place culturally in the sense that um, I was in this little ethnic immigrant uh, Muslim Arab enclave um, that, you know, stood in kind of stark contrast to uh, the rest of America in a lot of ways. Uh, and then within that enclave, uh, I was uh, atypical in that, like, my father was born here. Um, you know, I was, uh, uh, um, he was a native speaker of English and was also kind of a weirdo. <laughs> uh, was, um, was into things like science fiction, fantasy, comic books, uh, you know, uh, rock and roll, and, and things that um, uh, were not typical for the uh, um, elders in the Arab community that I grew up in. And so um, uh, I grew up essentially hearing the kind of call to Muslim prayer out my window uh, while I was reading my dad's copy of Lord of the Rings, right? And so if you kind of mash those things together, that's uh, naturally where, where some of the stuff that I uh, write comes from. And so I can't uh, stand up here and, and make any kind of declarative uh, universal statements about what it means to write Muslim American literature or uh, even what it means to write Muslim American fantasy. Um, I can talk about my own experiences uh, doing so and kind of some things that I've seen and learned and uh, um, I'll, I'll talk just about a couple of those. Um, probably the, the first thing uh, that you learn, uh, unfortunately, is that um, when you're a Muslim in this country, and I should say that um, uh, Muslim is a very broad term with a very diverse set of people involved in it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm particularly liberal in, in terms of kind of my interpretations, uh, more so than, than you know, some people I know and um, less so than other people I know. And so uh, um, there, um, when, I, when I describe myself as a Muslim, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing, uh, what that means theologically. But, uh, but certainly culturally, um, uh, there's really no escaping, and especially since 9-11, although certainly before then um, uh, it was a presence in my life, there's no escaping the fact that, you know, we're in a culture and a, a country uh, that has a lot of hostility towards Islam and that has a lot of hostility towards uh, Muslims. And uh, um, it's this kind of uh, constant tension in the back of your head, essentially. And uh, um, it's, it's something that you informs everything you do. And so when you come to writing, 
um, of course that's a presence. And when you come to fantasy writing in particular, uh, th th there's a particularly marked presence in a way, in the sense that um, uh, fantasy has typically been very kind of Eurocentric, maybe even more so than, than American literature in general. It's been very concerned with um, kind of white people and people who are, you know, the fairest, the fairest prince and, you know, these, these very kind of, um, it, it's almost, you know, for a country that's as multicultural, even leaving out kind of Arabs and, 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 and um, other people of color in this country, even amongst the kind of, you know, various white immigrant groups that have come to this country and mixed and matched. And um, uh, for a country that's as diverse, even uh, within, say, the white population, um, fantasy is almost a hearkening back, you know, especially Tolkien, to this kind of uh, racial purity, essentially, right? To this kind of imagined Anglo-Saxon history. And so we bring that baggage with us when we read fantasy and we kind of look at, you know, what are, who are the bad guys in Lord of the Rings? Well, it's the, the guys off to the east and the guys down south, right? And, uh, you know, they're uh, darker than the heroes. And when we read descriptions of the orcs, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff in there racially that has them sounding like black people here and sounding like Asians here. And um, so this kind of othering is, uh, is really kind of central in a lot of fantasy. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a kind of weird tension all my life growing up, right? And sort of reading this stuff um, and identifying with it in one sense, and then kind of seeing yourself cast when you appear at all, seeing yourself cast as a kind of villain at the same time. And it's a, uh, it's kind of a strange thing. Um, I think uh, what I'll do to kind of uh, evoke that a little bit is actually uh, read the first story here that I'm going to read. Um, now this is from, uh, and I'm going to read not the entire story, but selections. Uh, this is from an anthology called Rags and Bones, uh, which uh, came out just a, about a month or so ago. I was pretty fortunate to be in here sort of out of my uh, out of my league as it were Neil Gaiman and some other folks are in here and it's an anthology um, of kind of retellings of classic stories um, what I took on in this anthology uh, was the story uh, the fairy queen which is uh, by Edmund Spencer and uh, is kind of the ur text uh, of fantasy in a sense and uh, as soon as I can find it here we go um, I'm going to read you actually the, uh, the the statement. Each of the stories in this anthology has an author's note, kind of explaining what the author was thinking about when they when they wrote it. So um, I'm reading actually the newest thing that I have for you uh, first, kind of going in backwards order here. Um, and this story is called "Without Faith, Without Law, Without Joy." Um, it's uh, so the Fairy Queen is uh, Edmund Spencer's great epic. Uh, fantasy, essentially poem um, uh, from the 17th century, um, and it's uh, a kind of epic that is both a kind of adventure story starring this figure, the Red Cross Knight, and the Red Cross Knight is the hero of this this uh, kind of big, massive epic poem, um, and the Red Cross Knight embodies holiness, is the virtue that he embodies, right? Um, he wears a big red cross on his chest, and he's very much, he's St. George. Uh, it's an allegorical poem. He's St. George. Um, he's also sort of King Arthur Undiscovered, um, and he, um, he stands for holiness, and he stands for England itself, for Albion, right? Um, and it's the story of the Red Cross Knight going through these adventures across this kind of allegorical landscape, and if you've read anything from that period of time, you know that these allegories can get very weird, so he's walking and he sees, you know, one uh, mythological creature that's a woman who has a mouth full of, uh, of scorpions and um, she's error. And then she, he meets another character who's, you know, all these sort of vices evoked as, as physical monsters. Um, his eventual opponent uh, is uh, a dragon, but along the way to, uh, to fighting the dragon, uh, the Red Cross Knight, or Red Cross as he's called, St. George, um, uh, crosses paths with uh, three Saracen brothers, Saracen being the kind of old-fashioned word for, for Muslim, um, uh, essentially pagans in the eyes of the, the writer. And uh, uh, these three brothers are called, with, are called Sans Foy, Sans Loy, and Sans Joy. That is, without, love, without law, without faith, without joy. And in the poem of the Fairy Queen, these three brothers uh, 
exist only as kind of negative figures. They're sort of, they lack all the virtues that the noble, heroic Red Cross Knight has. Um, and so th just a, a little bit more on this note. So in the anthology, I said, Spencer's Fairy Queen is in many ways the unacknowledged ur text of the modern Anglophone epic fantasy novel. Everything we know and love about epic fantasy, sword fights, monsters, jaw-dropping scale, a cast of thousands, deliberate an antiqu antiquarianism, the ability to make magic real to a rational reader, it's all there in the fairy book. It's all there in the Fairy Queen book one. Uh, and it is one of the masterpieces of English literature. However, the Fairy Queen also prefigures many of epic fantasy's weaknesses. Uh, it rambles horribly. <laughs> there's too much description of clothing. And um, most importantly, there's a series of kind of gruesome caricatures of women, uh, of Arabs, of Catholics. Uh, and it kind of sets the precedent for epic fantasy's hatred of the other. Um, despite this, or perhaps because of it, I've always been uh, intrigued by the Saracen brothers, Sans Foy, Sans Loy, and Sans Joy. And I've always kind of wondered what it would be like to be that Muslim character trapped in this allegorical universe in which you've been made the bad guy. Uh, and so that's what this story is about. Um, So this is a most of uh, without law, without, without faith, without law, without joy. <clears throat> Holiness has murdered my brave brother. Holiness has mangled my mind and my name. Holiness has stolen God's love from me. I am walking a winding road of pale stone. Who am I? Where am I? I have answers, but they're forged falsehoods. For days, years, my brothers and I have been forced to live in this world that is not our world, and I have half forgotten my own. The one who abducted us, the mailed man thing called holiness, calls this place Albion. He calls it Fairyland. He calls it the Glorious Isle. The sunlight here is cold and lifeless, the trees are strange, and the birds have evil eyes. He has brought us here to test himself, to prove himself a worthy knight, to hunt us. I do not know how he brought us to this land of blood and iron masks. I know only that I am a real man trapped in a mad landscape of living lessons. My brothers and I were spirited here from my home in... Damascus? Yes. Praise be to God, I can remember that. The sound of the street preachers and the smells of the spice vendors' stalls. Damascus. We were sipping tea in a room with green carpets, and I saw, and I was laughing at a jest that, that someone was making. Who? The face. The voice. The name have all been stolen from me. All I know is that my brothers and I suddenly found ourselves on this twisted place, each aware of the other's fates, but unable to find one another, unable to find any escape. Now my eldest brother has been slain, and my next eldest brother has disappeared. Who am I? I do not know how he changed our names, but in this world of lions and giants and the blinding shine of armor, I am called Joyless, as if it were a name. It is not my name. It, it was not my name. But this is his place, and it follows his commands. And so, now, here, Joyless is my name, and Joyless has always been my name. This place, this Albion, has scrawled its hateful sigils over even the past. Now, when I remember my mother's voice calling for me across the small sook, I can only hear her voice of rock and honey saying, Joyless, Joyless, come here at once. Now my father's last whispered words to me, as sunlight streamed in the wood lattice window, his last words all those years ago are, Joyless, my beloved, thanks be to God that you are such a smart boy. It's the only name I can find in my mind and my memory now. Whatever I was once called, whatever I once called myself, has been stolen. Joyless. A part of me knows it to be false. Some small, near-dead piece of my soul knows that I was once a joyful man. Sometimes God grants me flashes of the man I once was, of what joy was, the feel of the falconer's glove as I hunted with my beautiful birds, the jeweled light of water the first time I saw the sea, the old poet at court granting my scribblings unfeigned praise. 
These are the sunbeams that break the murk for a moment here and there. Memories is too weak a word. They are like lightning, like the pain of a marked thief or a maimed soldier still feels in his hand. It still feels in a hand that has been lost. But they are so fleeting that they feel they become mere flashes of pain. And each day they fade, fewer, farther. Each day it becomes easier to succumb to the grim magic of this place that has claimed my kin, to forget joy, to forget who I am. Oh, I'll skip ahead just a bit. Um, the character we so far only know as Joyless is kind of continuing down the road and seeing all of the kind of uh, allegorical horrors that the Red Cross Knight uh, has put there to test himself. I am the only one who really lives now. I am the only son of my mother and my father that this thing in armor has not slain in body or soul. But it is only a matter of time. Of that I am certain. I can think of only one way to escape this fate. I could slay myself. The thought drifts to me, sweet and gentle as a breeze. Yes, I could destroy myself and be free of this place. My hand grips my sword hilt. In my mind, I see each of my brothers die again. And I take three deep breaths. No. No. I cannot abandon faith so. I cannot abandon God's own law so. Not when I watched my, own, my most beloved brother die fighting. Not when I've seen my law-loving brother turned to a beast. No, I cannot flee this saint. And if I cannot flee from him, I must hunt him. It doesn't take much to find him. He is singing songs of praise for his queen, his, vo his voice like a trumpet as it blares across the plains. I walk the pale stone road, following the sound of his songs, past castle and cavern, past a sleeping giant and a woman with a mouth full of scorpions. How many of us has he brought here with his magic? How many have been twisted into monsters on which he might wet his sword edge? After a half day's journey, I finally spy his tent like a great red war drum. He has stopped singing. I approach as quietly as I can, keeping to the trees, trying to remain unseen. Outside of the great scarlet tent of the Red Cross Knight, I see my dead brother's, my dead brother's battered shields. In the old poem, enchantments often die with those who've cast them. If I can somehow kill this knight, perhaps I can free my brother's souls from this mad land. I call on God for strength, and I force myself to remember that my brothers lived by faith and by law. My eyes burn with the effort, and as I watch, the letters on their shields waver as if seen through smoke. And uh, finally, uh, our, our narrator finds the Red Cross Knight and uh, engages into a confrontation. And all this time, um, the Red Cross Knight has kept uh, the narrator's name and the names of his brothers from him. And so that he's, he only knows his brothers as, as lawless and as uh, faithless. And he only knows himself as joyless. And uh, in this uh, last moment, and there is a, another name that he feels that the Red Cross Knight has been keeping from him, a name that he associates with his joy of his former life. And uh, um, we've yet to find out what that is. And this is the scene in which he finally confronts the Red Cross Knight. The Knight of the Bloody Red Cross, the killer saint, the hate that calls himself holiness, turns slowly. His impossibly handsome face is radiant, an unforgiving sun. His ice blue eyes are alight with bloodlust and madness. He answers my challenge with a haughty mock honor. He can afford this charade, for he knows that his grisly magic protects him. He has his chivalry and his cheat both. He wipes his gory hands on an unstained tabard. Soon, we stand twenty paces apart in a circle of hard-packed earth. Each of us prepares our arms and our armor, our hearts and our souls. Each of us dreams of killing the other, though I know that my dream is folly. Across the tanned leather of my buckler, Joyless, the only name I know now, is scrawled in lines like knife slashes. Another flash. I am young in the courtyard of a small mansion. I can see the old tree that I grew up reading beneath. An important man in yellow silk, 
my father, is training me to use the saber, though he knows I will never be the type who loves fighting. Always remember, Joyless, that you are fighting a man. Some part of me knows that my father did not call me Joyless, and yet I can remember the smell of his breath as he did so. It is the man you are fighting, not his sword or his dagger. The lightning flash fades. I look up at my foe. The Red Cross is no man. He is anger in a suit of armor. He is war made flesh. We raise our blades and step toward one another. His great sword sings. I deflect the blow with my saber and repost. We each dodge death once, twice, thrice. But each blow I meet rings through my muscle and weakens me. I will not last long. We match blow for blow for blow. Our swords meet in a storm of steel, and each of us staggers from the impact. For a long moment, we can only stand there and stare at each other, as shocked as two rams that have just butted heads. But I see in his snarl that this is all mock to him. Sweat barely beads, be sweat barely beads his brow, and his breath still comes easy. And my own body is sore and tired. Each breath I suck down is like drinking a bowl of fire. I will die soon. Red Cross attacks again. His great downward chop knocks my shield away, splitting the wood beneath the stretched hide. It comes close enough to killing me that I can smell the oil on his sword. I will die soon, but I will not die hiding. I will die doing what is right, what law and faith demand. And, and then the moments flow as slow as honey, and God takes mercy on a man about to die far from home. The Lord of the universe, of the true universe, grants me a boon. Before my eyes, the letters on my lost shield slip and tumble and writhe. They squirm and wriggle like newborn babes until I can nearly read my name. My name. My name. Not the name that this murderer saint has given me. Not the evil name that he has forced me to falsely recall having painted there. The man-thing holiness, with his monstrous mock courtesy, waits for me to regain my feet. I stand slowly, my eyes on the shield at Red Cross's feet. And as the letters reweave themselves, stolen memories return to my barren mind, like cool water on parched lips. My wise little daughter, sitting on her divan, mastering her letters at four. My daughter, Aisha. When we learned that my wife would never give birth again, I thought God had robbed me by not giving me a son. We had named her after the wife of the prophet, Aisha, alive. As she grew, I knew what true joy was, the clever tricks she pulled, my pride in spite of her uncle's disapproval as she wrote her first lines of poetry. Her name was Aisha. Red Cross's spell stole that joyful sound from me, but now it is mine again. Aisha, who made me as proud as any son could have. I will never see her again, but I will not die having forgotten her. Yes, I once knew joy. My daughter's name is Aisha, I say. My voice, her name, is sweet and strong in my own ears, like an angel's war horn. This place had nearly made me forget that I could speak. My brothers were Abdullah and Abdul Hakam. Red Cross's eyes widen with shock and fury, and he bares his teeth. Again, I fix my eyes on my lost shield. Ain, Ba, Dal. The Arabic letters of my name weave themselves into words. Lam, Wow. I am not joyless. I have never been joyless. You have lost, creature. I am Abdul Wadud, I shout at the saint. Abdul Wadud, the servant of God the loving. And as I raise my sword and I go to my death, I am smiling. So, uh, that was uh, without faith, without law, without joy. Um, a kind of, I guess, literalization of, uh, of what I see myself doing uh, uh, all the time when I'm writing fantasy, which is kind of uh, both honoring and, uh, and, and uh, acknowledging the tradition that I come from as a writer and also wrestling with it, and especially with its more um, problematic aspects. Um, take a glance at our time here. Uh, I'm 
you know, I could I could talk kind of on and on abstractly about kind of what being a Muslim writer means to me, um, but uh, it's it's the funny thing about. Um, kind of fiction writers and, and creative types that I do have a kind of background in, in academia, but part of the reason that I think uh, I, I ran away from a PhD program is because uh, there's a certain point at which um, rational explanation of what one does uh, uh, starts to fail and, uh, and you just sort of, you write and then Maybe once you've written something, you're sort of comfortable talking about it, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably more comfortable illustrating uh, the kinds of things that I think I'm doing as a Muslim writer uh, than I am kind of talking about them too much in the abstract. Um, uh, one of the things, though, that I, uh, uh, is very important to me is um, uh, not just in a kind of reactive way, uh, uh, um, writing in response to the kind of problematic aspects of, of the tradition, uh, the tradition of both just English literature in general and of fantasy specifically, um, but uh, in a kind of more positive and proactive way, um, telling stories that uh, are, are not told. Uh, and uh, casting heroes specifically, because I am, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not a kind of terribly meditative literary writer. I write stories about you know, people who hunt monsters and, and shoot aliens and <laughs> fight supervillains. And so, um, you know, w one of the things that uh, is important to me is that um, is the simple fact. And the sad thing is, uh, you know, in the 21st century uh, in, in, you know, uh, the United States, it's still kind of a uh, uh, an argument that we're having uh, is the simple fact of, of having different types of people as heroes. You know, um, uh, if, if you, you know, I mean, just think how few action movies um, have, for instance, female leads, right? Um, uh, it, it's, we're still very used to kind of thinking about one type of person as being a hero in our culture, and especially as being a kind of um, uh, genre hero. The heroes that we see in fantasy and science fiction are only now um, starting to, uh, to change and starting to look more like what our country looks like um, and what our, what our world looks like even more to the point. Um, uh, so certainly one of my tasks has, has uh, felt like the simple act of kind of giving people different kinds of heroes to identify with. And I think that, um, uh, I think it's, it's good for two reasons. Um, one is that there are a lot of readers like me. I mean, every week, you know, I'm, I'm not a terrible, I'm not George R.R. R. Martin, you know, I'm not a, I don't have, you know, millions of readers. Um, I have um, maybe a few thousand readers. Um, that said, I, even given that small number, the fact that every week, at least, uh, I receive an email or a message on Facebook or Twitter or whatever um, from someone who's uh, very often Muslim and or Arab, a younger reader, uh, who's come across uh, the book and, and said, oh my gosh, I've never been reading fantasy, you know, for, for 10 years, for 20 years. Um, and I've never come across uh, this, a hero who, you know, sounds like this or looks like this or, or prays like this. Um, uh, and, and sometimes it's actually, you know, people um, who are not necessarily Arab or Muslim, but are from uh, another kind of different kind of background uh, that has felt kind of equally marginalized by, uh, by the genre. Um, but the other side of it is that I've, I've, I've had an equal number of emails and kind of correspondences with uh, readers who are uh, very much from the mainstream of American culture and who, um, you know, are uh, their dad's uh, a lawyer in Arkansas and they grew up in an all white town with, uh, you know, uh, not just all white, but all Christian town and, uh, you know, had never met a Muslim before. And, uh, and I, I've literally had the, the, you know, this email and, and just my work being the first place where they kind of encounter not just a Muslim protagonist in fiction, but just kind of a Muslim telling their story and, uh, um, or a Muslim like character telling their story. And, uh, uh, you know, that, um, I think writers, we tend to be very self-important about how important our work is in changing the world, and I, I don't, I don't uh, tell myself that story too often because I think it leads to arrogance. But you know, those little moments are pretty are pretty gratifying. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, um, I, I think maybe one of the most radical things that uh, um, being a Muslim American writer means in our current historical moment is just um, kind of telling stories that are either not being told um, or are, you know, that people are actively hostile against. And uh, there is still a 
pretty significant portion uh, of the country that um, just as soon as the word Islam is out of your mouth or Muslim, or as soon as a Muslim name comes to their ears, uh, you know, they react, you know, with uh, um, uh, images of terrorism um, because people have been conditioned to. And uh, I think in an environment like that, um, simply making your superhero um, uh, you know, uh, have a Muslim last name, or simply having your uh, your cowboy um, uh, uh, pray like a Muslim is uh, is is a kind of small act of rebellion. And um, I uh, want to leave time for a Q and A. So um, I'm actually going to read one more story. Speaking of cowboys, um, and I am not tweeting here. I've got the story on my iPad. So um, this is a, a little bit lighter, I think, than, uh, than the uh, last piece. Um, this story is, uh, is one of the uh, earlier short stories that I have published, um, and it's called Mr. Hodge's Sunset Ride. Um, a little bit of background on this piece. Uh, my family is uh, probably one of the earliest um, Muslim Arab families uh, in the country. Uh, my great-grandmother was born in South Dakota in 1910 and uh, she now she and her daughter grew up kind of back and forth from the states in the Middle East is a little bit complicated um, so uh, to say that you know it's not just that our family came over and then we've been here ever since there's a kind of a back and forth uh, from Lebanon but um, but we, but uh, my family was here quite early and uh, you know my great grandmother would tell me stories about being a little girl in South Dakota and uh, you know she was 10 years old 1920 in South Dakota that was that was still almost the old west I mean it was just kind of just out of of, of, of the western period the classic western period and uh, um, there, there is this history. The one thing you find out when you dig into American history is that, um, you know, everybody's been everywhere. There's been one person, at least, from whatever group in whatever weird, you know, corner of American history and geography you find. And, uh, and, and once you start reading up on this stuff, um, uh, there is this history. And, and so in the Arab American Museum, um, the National Arab American Museum in uh, uh, Dearborn, they actually have a, a door from, uh, from one of the first mosques in the country. Uh, it actually has a bullet hole <laughs> in it um, that I, I, I don't know that it was like hate crime or I, I don't know the story behind that bullet hole. I should, I should research this, but, um, but um, uh, that dated back to either the very early 20th century or the late 19th century. And so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting seeing how long some people have been around some places. Um, uh, all of that is kind of maybe a little bit more serious than this story, which is basically a zombie cowboy story. So, um, uh, and uh, you're going to have to forgive me because I uh, I like to do I like to do funny voices, but I'm not very good at them. And uh, this narrator is um, uh, is an old West narrator. So if there's anybody who's like actually from the uh, American West are from down south and you're offended by my accent, you know, I'll give you a, come see me after the reading, I'll give you a card to do like a bad Arabic accent. That's, um, <laughs> could do an exchange. Um, uh, so I think uh, we'll read this and then, uh, and then go to Q&A. Um, so this is Mr. Hodge's Sunset Ride and uh, it opens um, from a quote from the Quran. And whoso saveth the life of one it shall be as if he had saved the life of all mankind. The toughest man I ever met? That's an easy answer to give, but a tricky tale to tell. Mr. Hodge was from the same place as my rattlesnake, as a, a rattlesnake of a paw, Araby or some place like that, though I don't rightly know the name, since neither him nor my paw ever said a blasted word about the old country. You'd ask and ask, and all you'd get back was a look as hard as rocks. No use digging after that. I've ridden with good men and bad men, but I never rode with a man like Mr. Hodge. That wasn't his proper name, just a way of calling the old man respectful-like. My pa taught me that, if I ever met a man from the old country, to call him Hodge. Damn near the only thing that son of a bitch ever taught me. 
Anyhow, a good few years back now, when I was a young, full of himself bounty hunter, I was riding with Mr. Hodge in the Black Hills. We rode together about a year. He was a little leather brown knot of a man with a moonlight white beard, and he took an immediate and powerful shine to me on account of my paws being from Araby. Now, understand, I'm a bastard. I carry my mama's name, O'Connor. But the way I look, a little darker than the average man I know, and you can see the hatchet nose, well, I get taken for a lot of things. South of the border, I fibbed that I was half Mexican. Lived a summer trading with the Cheyenne, claiming to be part red man. Even got chased out of town once when I winked at the wrong girl because they, sure they were sure as hell I was mulatto. It can be hell sometimes being different things to different folks, but it can be right useful too. Well, Mr. Hodge must have smelled the old country on my blood somehow. Like I say, he took a shine to me. And me knowing how to call him respectfully, well, that seemed to seal it for him. I can't say I ever understood it, but Mr. Hodge was the kind of man you wanted on your side, so I wasn't about to complain. For what it's worth, I was the last man ever saw him alive. The last time I rode with Mr. Hodge, we was in a little shit town in Texas, trailing Parson Lucifer's gang. Old Parson Lucifer was an ex-preacher, mad as a rabid dog. Said he took the name Parson Lucifer because he was part blessed and part damned like any man. I can't say I ever saw the blessed part, though. Like I said, the man was out of his blasted mind. Anything ruthless or nasty you might have heard about his gang was probably the plain truth. That three-day slow murder of the blacksmith and his wife in Deadwood, done with their own smithing tools, that weren't no tale. The widower sheriff of redemption and his baby boys getting their ears chopped off and force-fed to them. Yeah, Parson Lucifer did that too. We were in the employ of the town of Crossblood, where even the old Sunday school teacher was foaming at the mouth to see Parson Lucifer and his gang strung up. They'd lost a lot to those boys. Most of the gang had been caught before we ever got hired, and what got done to him wasn't, wasn't none too pretty, neither. But Parson Lucifer and his two sons were still out there. Well, one and a half of his sons, anyway. To hear it told, two sheriff's deputies had fired three shots each into his youngest, Shambles. There wasn't nothing left but a bloody pulp shaped like a man, but Parson Lucifer and his eldest, James, went through the trouble of killing two more people just to haul off the younger boy's body. Now, Mr. Hodge and me weren't the only hunters hunting those dogs, but it was us that found him. Rather, it was him that found him by serenading the rocks. See, that old man could sing. I don't think he knew what half the words meant, but when Mr. Hodge started in on them old cowboy songs, well, sure as I'm standing here, when that man got to crooning a tune, he made the earth himself cry. This ain't just me tale-telling, you understand. I've seen tears fall from big red rocks when that old man hummed. I heard stones weep, and they parted before him. So when Mr. Hodge said that a stone in the road told him where to find Parson Lucifer, I didn't doubt it. And though it still spooked me, I didn't flinch when he sang softly to a great big cliff face until it wept and opened a passage to a perfect ambush perch. Y'all ain't got to believe me for it to be the truth. I never learned Mr. Hodge's Christian name, but tell the truth, I don't think he was a Christian. Not to say he wasn't living Christianly, you understand. When we were down Mexico way, that man would toss his last peso at the first beggar who asked. But I don't think he ever touched a Bible in his life, and Sunday to him was just another day. Every evening, he'd roll out this funny little rug. Then he'd turn his back to the setting sun, bow down, and say some of his words. Heathen praying, far as I could tell. You gonna do that every night? I'd ask him early on. Should be more, he'd say in that rocks and honey voice. And that was all he'd ever say on the matter. No, it wasn't nothing Christian. But my mama taught me that another man's religion was like another man's wife. None of my goddamn business. That old gal taught me a lot of lessons. But sticking to my own business was just about the best of them. Granted, he ain't seemed to like words a whole lot. He never said much more than, yup, nope, I reckon, and good, huh? Once in a while, he'd get real mad, he'd start talking his old country talk, sounding like, like a man clearing his throat with flowers. I suppose it would have drove a lot of men mad riding with a man as quiet as that. 
And I can't say that once in a while, I didn't wish Mr. Hodge was a bit more social. But I always like my quiet. There ain't nothing in this world that drives me up the wall like riding with a man who keeps talking when there ain't nothing to say. I always knew Mr. Hodge was there, and that was all I needed to know. By my hope of being saved, I tell you, I never saw a man as good with a gun. It wasn't natural the things that old man could do with a Navy Colt or a Winchester. You think I'm talking tall, but I swear it before the Almighty himself. I see Mr. Hodge shoot the buck teeth off a jumping jackrabbit. I seen him shoot another man's bullets out of the air. I seen him shoot more than a couple of men, too. We made over a dozen bounties in that year together, and not all of them were alive. Not by a clean sight. We were spying on Parson Lucifer and his son from our hiding place high in the cliff face when Mr. Hodge, for reasons known only to him at the time, insisted we wait until the next day to nab the bastards. Well, I didn't want to hear that. I was a foolish young man in those days, hot and headstrong with even more to prove than your average prairie boy. Tomorrow, he said, making the words sound like his old country talk. He was loading his colt with funny-looking bullets. Silver, if I didn't miss my guess. Tomorrow? We got him dead to rats right now. What, with them powers you got... Mr. Hodge looked up from his gun and ran a hand over his beard. Powers? Shut up, you. Just a knack. A knack? You can... I stopped, knowing I'd flap my gums too much. The old man didn't like when I brought up the things he could do. His eyes narrowed, like I just called his mama a whore. Somewhere out there in the purple early evening, a, co a coyote howled. Mr. Hodge spit at my feet and jabbed a tree branch trigger finger at me. You talk too much. Just heed, huh? Tomorrow. Now look here, I said. You know I respect your experience, and I do try to heed you, but... Should be more, the old man said and turned his back to me. Now, if I'd had half a head on my shoulders, that would have been the end of it. But I was young, a little fired up, and a lot of stupid. I thought I could make Mr. Hodge respect me, and half a whiskey flask later, I just knew I could do it by bushwhacking two outlaws single-handed. So after Mr. Hodge had turned his back to the sunset, said his should-be-more rug prayer to the heathen god, and gone to sleep, I snuck down the cliff. Like I said, young and stupid. If I hadn't been drunk on top of that, I might have given a second thought to those silver bullets Mr. Hodge had been fiddling with. Now, them boys was too smart to set a campfire. But the moon was big and bright, and by its light I could see Parson Lucifer's white preacher collar. He was snoring away, but his son James was on watch. I crept up behind James, close and quiet. Now, even a boy as brash as I was knows that taking on two men at once, even if one of them is sleeping, requires getting underhanded. And when it came to a gang of killers like Parson Lucifer's, well, I got no problem shooting a man in the back. So that's what I done. Three shots right up that boy James's spine. Except in, it wasn't James that I shot. It wasn't James that turned around. It was the other boy, the dead boy. I swear it by God in my mama's grave. That boy they called Shambles just stared at me, something like a smile on his rotten lips, his chop steak half of a face. I put another slug right through his eyeball, but the boy didn't even bleed. Now, I heard that he, when he was a natural, living man, they called him Shambles on account of his funny walk. But when I shot that boy four times and he ain't stopped coming at me, well, that name wasn't so funny no more. My mouth dried up, my heart hammered hard, and I screamed and ran back the way I came. But there was Parson Lucifer cut right across my path, wide awake and a revolver in his gray-gloved hand. His boy James was beside him. They didn't shoot me, just laughed and told me to drop my gun or they'd give me to shambles. I heard the dead boy laughing through his open throat, and I won't lie, I wet myself. Then I dropped my gun. Half an hour later, I found myself lying trussed up on the ground with two teeth knocked out. Parson Lucifer's boot heel was digging into my cheek, and I was wishing I'd listened to Mr. Hodge instead of letting my hot blood send me off half-cocked. Don't look so worried, boy, the old bandito laughed. I ain't gonna kill you yet. No, you got to die in a special way, a slow way. That hex that raised my boy Shambles is constantly calling for fresh blood. 
Having you here, well, this saves me dangerous raiding on a town. He took his boot from my face and strutted slowly into view. He smiled a nasty little smile and looked up at the night sky. The blood spilling, it has to happen at sunrise when Shambles sleeps. So you got yourself another few hours to live. Tears started to burn in my eyes. It's one thing to get shot, but it's another thing to have your, it's another thing entire to have your blood spilled for black magic. I swallowed and foolishly tried to play on the guilty conscience of a man who didn't know what conscience was. You know you killed the little girl during that last robbery. Eight years old and you, I felt fear filling me, but I still wasn't ready to make the man shoot me premature for naming him as the monster he was. I switched up to make like I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. Now, look, it could be it was an accident, I started, but Parson Lucifer just frowned at me like a disappointed uncle. Boy, there ain't nothing involving a pistol and Parson Lucifer ever an accident. A better man would have called Parson Lucifer a devilish dog-faced son of a whore just then. But it wasn't a better man lying there with his face in the dirt. It was just me, and I kept my peace as that devilish dog-faced son of a whore went on. That girl died for a purpose, boy. More than most folk these days can claim. Every man and every child must play his part. I ravage so that our Lord Christ can heal. Yeah, and I guess you make a nice living doing it, don't you? The old bastard smiled. There's a Caesar in all of us, boy, and we must render unto him what is his. But the girl's was just one life. Even way the hell out here, there's a lot of lives to go around. Ain't any one of them any more sacred than another, far as God's concerned. You think our Savior cares more about some snot-nosed child than a sinner like me? You must not read your Bible then, boy. Ain't no man ever kept Jesus' love busier than I have. That thing that he called his son shambled into my view and it gibbered something. Whatever it used to be, right then it just looked like a plate of bloody meat walking on two legs. My breath caught in my chest. What about that creature there, I said, trying to make the bold in me cover up the scared pissless. My hex brought my boy Shambles back alive, even when that snaky deputy did, even after what that snaky deputy did to him. That's the Lord's work, boy. Same thing our Savior did with Lazarus. This here is a Christian hex I put on my beautiful baby boy. I couldn't hardly help myself. Mister, I don't know what to call that, except to say that it's about as Christian as pissing in the pulpit on a Sunday morning. And at that moment, Mr. Hodge appeared from I don't know where, looking in my frightened eyes like an avenging angel of the Lord. He sang a quick string of words in his talk, sounded similar to his sunset prayers as best as I could tell. The rocks around us wailed right back, and Parson Lucifer looked around all frantic-like. Then Mr. Hodge shot five of them silver bullets right into shambles. That thing that used to be a living man stopped and dropped to the ground. There wasn't no blood coming from where Mr. Hodge had shot him, but the way he started moaning, well, it was like all them bullets that he oughtn't have been able to walk away from all caught up with him at once. There was one last howl, like a demon getting his tooth yanked by the meanest barber in the world. Then Shambles stopped moving, stopped kicking, and died an honest death. Mr. Hodge already had his gun on Parson Lucifer, and now he was whistling Bright River Valley. The rocks kept a wailing, and I swear to y'all, that a little piece of flint jumped up and cut my bonds. But by then, the boy James, who'd been off shaking a sagebrush when Mr. Hodge showed up, had his gun on me. James gestured towards me with a gun and growled at Mr. Hodge. Well, it looks like we're all of us in a fix here. My daddy can't see no hangman. He said it in that fast, slow Kansas City way that drives a prairie boy like me clean out of my mind, and his paw finally wore a look of real fear. Now. I don't know what kind of Injun magic you got hold of here, but my daddy can't see no hangman. You hear me, old man? Whatever kind of red man devilishness you done worked against my daddy's hex, you better hope you can lift it by bringing back my baby brother. I got a clean shot right here at your... There was no movement that I saw, but there was a shot. And then there was smoke coming from Mr. Hodge's gun, and a boy with a hole in his head was lying where a fast-talking murderer had just stood. He hurt a lot of people. He had a price to pay. Should be more. Nine words. For Mr. Hodge, it was like a whole sermon. He looked up at a patch of moonlit. He looked up at a patch of moonlit cloud in the eastern sky, and he nodded 
like he'd been arguing with the Almighty and was granting God a point. He didn't even flinch when Parson Lucifer spun around and shot him twice in the chest. I tried to stop it, fumbled James's dropped gun into my hand and fired in Parson Lucifer's direction, feeling like my anger alone could push the bullet through his skull. I'm proud to say I killed that hex-casting son of a bitch, but it wasn't fast enough. Parson Lucifer and his boys were dead, but that didn't change Mr. Hodge lying there with two holes in him, and it didn't stop the little red rivers that seeped into the dirt around his old oak root of a body. As I say, I was still half green back then, but I'd already come to know by sight which wounds a man might walk away from. One look told me that Mr. Hodge wasn't going nowhere else in this world. Any other man would have been screaming himself silly, but Mr. Hodge was so quiet I could hear the wind whispering in the brush. He grit his teeth and refused the rum and laudanum that I offered him. Tough us all, he said, and I thought he was speaking the old country talk. I wish my pa or anyone from the old country was there just to hear him say his piece. It's a hell of a thing to speak your last words to a man who can't understand your language. But he said it again, and I realized I did understand. Tough us all, the old man was saying, the first time I ever heard him talk proud. Tough as all hell. Yeah, you are that, Mr. Hodge, I said to him. There ain't no man anywhere can begrudge you that. That man bought my life with his, as God is my witness. I didn't see what I'd done to deserve it. To tell the truth, I told him as much as he lay there dying. The old coot spit out some blood and seemed smiled real mean-like. For you, <laughs> he said and shook his head. He pointed a long brown trigger finger up at the sky like he was naming a target. Mm, for him, I heard a lot of people. Price to pay. Should be more. And that was the last thing he said. I watched the light go slowly out of his eyes, saw that smile go slack. I smelled crushed roses in the air, though I can't say where the scent came from. For a long time, I just sat there, my thoughts mingling with the moon shadows. I spent that sleepless night burying him with a short-handled shovel, his guns and his little heathen rug beside him. Come morning, I was wore out as a man could be, but it was time to leave. Ashes to ashes, I said, by way of goodbye to the old man. Dust to dust. Then I dragged myself eastward, my eyes half blinded by the rising sun. That's it. Uh, alrighty, uh, thanks for staying awake. Let's, I'll take a breath. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone has. There, uh, there are books uh, for sale, copies of the novel uh, Throne of the Crescent Moon, um, and uh, I'm happy to sign those. If you've brought books of your own, I'm happy to sign them, or just questions from anyone. Can you get the yeah. <laughs> Donahue style. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anyone? Sure, sir. I bet we could probably hear you if you talk. <laughs> so I know your focus is on you know writing Muslim American uh, fantasy in that sense. How have you come across much in terms of um, Arab fantasy that you feel there's a significant difference in the way you approach it versus say? If you weren't Muslim American, if you were just Muslim and you were writing fantasy, do you right. feel there's a significant difference? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, it, it, it's very hard for me to disentangle the two. Um, I mean, much of what I think of and what I've experienced as as Muslim culture for me has been Arab, uh, or more accurately, Arab American culture, and so um, I think that you. Uh, it, when I interact with um, with fans, with kind of especially science fiction and fantasy fans, it's it's, it's been interesting seeing different parts of the world. My expertise, my kind of cultural training, as it were, is essentially uh, uh, Lebanese and Egyptian. And uh, you know, I've uh, since putting out the book, I've had readers who are like from Malaysia or um, Muslim from the Philippines or um, uh, uh, you know from Sub-Saharan Africa. Or and um, it's been it's been interesting seeing how being a Muslim geek in these different cultures is means pretty different things in different in different cultural contexts. Um, if I were 
you know, Turkish, it would probably, I would probably write differently, sure, you know. Um, on the other hand, if I were an Arab Christian, I would probably also write very differently, you know, and there are, you know, many, many uh, Arab Christians, of course. So it's, uh, it's the, the two are, are fused for me. Um, and, you know, are, it's very important to note that, that the religion of Islam and, and Arab as an ethnicity are very, very different things. But for me personally, they've always been fused in the way that I've grown up. So it's probably hard for me to, to disentangle the two. Other questions? Sure, please. Um, you said earlier that. Oh. <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you said earlier that um, there are more um, characters of ethnicity coming out as being um, heroes. Do you contribute that more to the way publishing has changed or way more culture has changed? I don't know if it's, uh, if it's so much publishing per se, although um, I think that publishing is more accountable now. Um, you know, it, it, it really, like almost every industry, um, you know, uh, movie making as well, the music industry, you know, um, you did have this period where at least on the national level, the stuff that was coming out was really uh, filtered through these, this, this very small community of gatekeepers. And they were demographically, they were not just, uh, you know, almost all white, but, you know, almost all male, uh, mostly straight or at least publicly straight, um, you know, from uh, living in New York, you know. And so uh, there, there, there is this kind of um, uh, monotonous uh, or, um, you know, and homogenous kind of uh, culture that I think um, books, TV, movies, all this stuff um, has been filtered through historically. Uh, I think it's changing partially because of things like, say, self-publishing and stuff like that, but even more so because of things like Twitter and, and, and Facebook. And, you know, you don't want to over say, oh, the Internet has changed everything. It's a different world. And, you know, but there, there, is, there is a lot of truth to that in that, for instance, um, if you want to talk about, um, if somebody says, you know, if some prominent comic book artist says, oh, well, girls don't read comic books. You know, that used to just go and fly. And now, you know, Twitter is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, crucifying somebody who says that, you know, within an hour of them making this stupid ass comment, right? So um, there is this maybe increased sensitivity. And then of course, the big thing is of course, the demographic shift in the States is that, you know, um, you know we're really, um, we're fundamentally a multicultural country. We always have been, but we're kind of, uh, we're looking that way in terms of kind of um, just how far apart people are coming from, how many of them, and not just in places like, you know, uh, like in New York or California or something like that, but you can go to Oklahoma and find some, you know, random Somali population there. You can go to, you know, uh, uh, you know wherever it may be in this part of the country that used to seem very isolated and, and homogenous. Even these areas are becoming more and more heterogeneous. And, that combined with kind of constant access to all kinds of entertainment from wherever in the world people want to find it. Um, you know, it's like if some new cartoon comes out in Pakistan, you can watch, even if you don't know Urdu, you can watch the, uh, you know, you can watch the first episode on YouTube now. And so I think that's, all those things kind of combine to kind of making a more accountable and, and you know, hopefully more diverse um, culture, uh, just in general. And so that's definitely reflected, I think, in, in fantasy and science fiction too. Still got a ways to go, but other questions? Sure, yeah. You, sir. <laughs> the microphone. Um, I was just curious, was there a definitive moment in your past where you chose to write in the Muslim viewpoint, or is it just kind of your natural voice as an author? You know, I think I think it um, it's been pretty organic for me um, in that um, I've always uh, you know I used to so I'm, I'm a big Dungeons and Dragons nerd and I, I grew up um, as much as uh, even more so perhaps than reading you know actual fantasy novels reading these Dungeons and Dragons books and comic books and things like that and. Um, you know, so in Dungeons and Dragons, you always come up with you you create your own characters, and uh, I would uh, I would just gravitate towards creating these quasi Middle Eastern characters, and I I, I don't you know um, my father uh, uh, was involved in um, uh, founding an Arab community center, and so he he was uh, very um, without kind of being 
belligerent about it was always very kind of uh, instilling a strong sense of kind of ethnic, a little less religious in his case because he's a pretty secular guy, um, uh, sense uh, of kind of who I was. And, and I think that, and he was also in the person who encouraged me most. I lost my mother when I was very young. Um, he was the person who encouraged me most creatively. And so I think that that I was getting these same messages from the same guy probably um, probably did a lot. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and I think that the other thing is that uh, as a writer, when you come to a crowded field, um, you start to think about what you have to contribute that uh, that other people aren't doing, you know. And so I could have, you know, I could have written yet another, you know, novel about a fantasy thief, you know, that uh, that's wearing leather armor and is, you know, in this. But um, uh, but it felt like I had something maybe different to say that wasn't that wasn't being said. So those things probably happened at the same time. Other questions? Anyone? Yeah, sure, no problem. So speaking of voices, and it, from what I can tell, you're approaching this from a place where there's a voice that really isn't being heard, and you're saying, hey, there's these stories. Have there been other people's voices out there that have surprised you? you know? Sure. Um, um, now, do you mean um, just in general, kind of in terms of the diversity, or specifically in terms of Arab and Muslim stuff? No, I meant in general, in terms of diversity, because we're seeing this explosion of diversity, and yeah, you're yeah. one facet of it. Are there other yeah, facets? Yeah, yeah. There's um, um, uh, rather than me try and like list authors. Uh, if you if you just um, Google like diversity, science fiction and fantasy, it's astonishing over just the past very few years how much. Um, how much stuff is being written by kind of people from different backgrounds and, and stuff set in, in, in different worlds too, I should say, not just in terms of the biography of the writer, but it's like a, a dear friend of mine is a guy named Howard Andrew Jones, who is, you know, he's a middle-aged white guy from Indiana, you know, but he has written this series um, with these kind of eighth century uh, Middle Eastern heroes. And uh, um, so it's not necessarily just like, oh, you're from this background, write this kind of fantasy, uh, but the combination of kind of interest in a diverse set of kind of uh, uh, influences and actual writers who are, are, are more diverse than they were a generation ago. Uh, I mean, there's there's remarkable stuff out there. Um, I mean, a few names that come to mind, Howard Andrew Jones, um, uh, Elizabeth Baer has a recent series that uh, is based on kind of Mongol myth. Um, N.K. Jemisin, who's a dear friend of mine, um, has two series. Her first is her her main character is essentially biracial and but in this very kind of you know fairest of them all court. Uh, and then uh, her second series is is straight up based on uh, a kind of um, uh, you know black Egypt analog. And uh, so there there are these writers out there who are doing this stuff, and not just a, according to gender lines, but, uh, you know, it's part of uh, a reinvention of the genre in general, I think, and an interest in kind of some of the thornier stuff that, you know, a writer like Tolkien often, you know, uh, Tolkien was writing an intentionally idealized mythology, you know, and uh, the generations of writers who've come since him have kind of wanted to pick that apart, and so that means everything from kind of a wider variety of ethnicities uh, kind of being depicted in the in the uh, the worlds that are being created and, and among the writers themselves, uh, questioning kind of gender politics. Um, there's, you know, people writing, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, trans protagonists, you know, and gay protagonists in, in, epic fa in epic fantasy, which, you know, would have been unheard of kind of a generation ago. And so, and even in the, the quote unquote mainstream, if you look at like, you know, who's the best selling, kind of a, a you know, middle-aged white guy, New York Times bestseller fantasy writer is George R. R. Martin right now, right? Who's having his show made into, or his books made into a TV show. Even George is sort of like looking at this world that he was handed and saying, well, well, what about this? What about, you know, the fact that kingship is a really kind of crazy and messed up thing? And, uh, and what about the way that, that women were treated in this world? And what kind of, you know, options did they have? And so there's, there, there's a general, I think, deconstruction of, of fantasy that's, um, that diversity is kind of happening hand in hand with. And I think it's, it's a pretty exciting time for the field for that. Any other burning questions? Sir, in the orange. Uh, yes, um, I was wondering if are you, have you 
thought of or are, have you done some like retelling of English American uh, fantasy tales? Like there has been some very graphic retellings of like Snow White and that kind right. of stuff. Yeah. Have you thought about doing it from a Muslim American yeah. point of view and what it would look like? from that point of view? Right. Well, the, the first story I read um, that was a, a response to the Fairy Queen is probably the closest thing that I've, I've come to writing that. Um, I, I haven't taken on fairy tales directly per se, but uh, um, you know, there's always, there's always ideas percolating in the back of the head, and it's, it's, it's rich, ripe material too. And uh, um, you know, the other big fairy tale source for me, um, or not fairy tale, but the folklore source for me is the Arabian Nights. And, uh, and those stories are, um, are, are something that have been a, a huge influence on me too. So what about like, I mean, there's some, uh, stuff by, from the Grimm brothers. That's oh, sure. Not fairy tale. Oh, sure. That can be very gruesome, but yeah. very fantasy. Is that yeah. something that, well, you know, it, 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 that's a case to me of like other people have already done that better than I'll ever do it. If you read a writer like, uh, like Cat Valente, Catherine Valente, um, you know, there are writers whose, uh, whose whole career is kind of, uh, um, examining those fairy tales and, and getting to the bloody part, you know, it's like the little mermaid, ain't Disney if you if you go and, and, and read you know the the original story and and there are a, a great number of stories like that but I think that's something that that there's a there's a whole kind of school of writers who do that really well and I'm um, I don't know if that's where my talents lie you know oh, there's okay well if there's questions that people want to ask that they're not comfortable asking in front of everyone or want to chat I'm, I'm here um, otherwise thank you so much everyone for coming I appreciate it Thank you. And if uh, if anyone wants anything signed, I'm um, I'm up here. So thanks. <laughs>